Seal Aftermarket Products engineers and manufactures Toledo Transkit with the rebuilder in mind, including everything you need to get the job done right. Toledo Transkit is the number one choice of installers because of all the intensive research and development that goes into each component in every kit. Like re-engineered valve body gaskets, preventing EPC damage by eliminating the shredding you get from original equipment. Plus, all of the extra essentials that are included, like spring and screen filters that should be changed at overhaul. Toledo Transkit even includes loose valve body gaskets that fit all 19 bonded separator plates. At Seal Aftermarket Products, we don't just make kits, we make kits better. Ask for Toledo Transkit by name. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another ATRA webinar. Uh, my name is Mike Souza. Today we'll be presenting the 722.6 transmission, also referred to as the NAG-1. Uh, this transmission obviously can be found in Chrysler products like Dodge Jeep vehicles and some Chrysler cars, and obviously it's, uh, it's found in most Mercedes. First, I'd like to uh, thank Seal Aftermarket Products uh, for sponsoring the webinar that makes it free and available to everyone, members and non-members of ATRA. Any questions or comments, please send your emails to webinars at aftra.com. If you have any questions that you want to ask during the webinar, please feel free to go ahead and text them to me, and I'll do my best to be able to answer any questions that you uh, text in. A lot of times guys ask me, they say, gee, we went from the 722.6 and we jumped right up to 722.9. Whatever happened to the other two numbers in between? Uh, basically, the 7226 is still a five-speed, so obviously the last digit doesn't refer to the forward speeds. Same thing with the 722.9. That's a seven-speed. Well, there is a 7227 and a 722.8. These vehicles that are equipped with this transmission are not found usually in the U.S. Although I've seen some of them around the Washington, uh, Washington D.C. area and some in Canada, a lot of the guys overseas that are based in Germany will sometimes purchase one of these vehicles and bring it back to the States. The 7227 is basically a front-wheel drive five-speed similar to a Honda. The 7228 is a CVT transmission. Now, both these transmissions can be found in A and B class Mercedes vehicles, uh, like I said before, mostly found in Europe. Um, the CVT, from what I understand, because I do a lot of calls over in Europe on this transmission, uh, seems to be real high in, uh, and having failure problems. So luckily, we're not seeing too many of them here. Although the 7226 came out uh, after the 7225, it's still a five-speed. They had a lot of problems with the uh, fifth gear section of the 7225s, uh, as well as you guys have probably run into in the past working on those. So this unit basically replaced that. So now that's out of the way, let's take a look at the 722.6. This is the North American Mercedes VIN ID, and there will be several charts we're going to talk about. One chart will show the type, uh, body style will be in chart 2, the year model will be found in chart three. And also the manufacturing plant is found in chart four. These are the four charts that I was talking about. As you can see that the, uh, the identification numbers on the VIN will, will help you determine where it was built in the, the model year and, and what and so forth. Now, vehicle identification is important. This tag that we're looking at here on the side of the transmission if this is a good time to take out your either your cell phone camera or some guys like to keep an inexpensive camera right there laying on the bench to take pictures of valve body check ball locations and things like that when they've never uh, seen that particular unit before. Uh, the reason that I say that we want to take this information down is because it's important that we have the correct transmission for the vehicle we're working on. The planetary tooth count, the pinion gear, the uh, actual ring gear and sun gear tooth counts are different on many models. 
And if it doesn't match the vehicle, obviously we could be chasing ratio codes only because the wrong ratio was installed. So this is a good time to uh, take a picture of those IDs if you have it on your bench. And what you need to do is get a, uh, save your own chart. Start putting a chart together um, as to what year, make, model, and the size that it came from. And count the two counts on the uh, planetary system so we know what goes to that vehicle. There's no list of that I know from the manufacturer's uh, point, uh, a list of any of these ratios for what vehicles they go to. So it's good to record your own and have your own database on it. Now looking at the transmission barcode, right after the um, five letters that we see, we notice we have three digits. That's going to be the actual Julian date when the vehicle was actually built. As you can see here on the uh, vehicle ID calendar, we had a 344, and that, that's for December. And as you can see, if you look across to this side of the chart, this is the day that it was built. So we know that that ID number is for the 10th of December. If anyone remembered the ID that we saw on the first picture of the transmission, it was actually a 262. So we know that that was built in September, and the day it was built was on the 19th. So the information there is pretty handy to have. Model designation, Mercedes obviously refers to it as a 722.6, and then Chrysler and Sprinter uh, may refer to it as something else. The engineering design, the numbers that we refer to, um, as you can see, the 6 doesn't refer to the forward speed. That's a sales designation. Um, when we see the sales designation, uh, like you'll find if you're looking it up on Mitchell's or all that, you may see it called the W5A580, uh, uh, depending, obviously, on the, the torque capacity of the transmission. Now, the number 5 here definitely refers to the amount of forward gears that the transmission has. The 580 is the maximum input torque. These are the applications that you'll find in most Chrysler and Jeep products. As you can see here, we have the Grand Cherokee, which shows BUX, which really means built, built up for export. Now, at first, when these models came out, we didn't see diesel engines in a Jeep here in the U.S. They were mostly found over in Europe. But now we're starting to see more and more Jeeps with diesel engines found in the U.S. So you have the, that information on that chart there. And this is the Mercedes application chart. Now these numbers that we have after the 6 are kind of important. Um, obviously, this, this model is going to, uh, a 646 is going to be for that particular vehicle that it belongs to. So the valve body has to match the transmission, which has to match the differential tire size and engine size of the vehicle. So any mismatches here can have you chasing uh, shift faults or codes, and it's only because we have the wrong uh, assemblies mismatched together. This is the component application chart. We have three brake clutches. We have three driving clutches, and this unit has two sprags. You can see we have an F1 sprag that's held in first. The F2 sprag is held in second, uh, first and second. Now, the other thing odd about the 7226 is you'll notice here we have two different reverse ratios. Um, obviously, in regular reverse that we're going to have the uh, B1 clutch and the K, uh, F1 sprag holding. And then if you're in winter mode or sport mode, you'll have a second ratio for reverse. And as you can see, the K1 clutch is holding for that one. Now, let's talk a little bit about the solenoids. And this can be confusing because Mercedes uses six solenoids on the valve body. There's three shift solenoids, a converter clutch solenoid, a pressure control solenoid, and a shift pressure control solenoid. Now, the terms that Mercedes uses for these solenoids may not be related to, their, to the function of that solenoid. Now, the three shift solenoids, the first one is a 1, 2, 4, 5 shift solenoid. And then you have a 2, 3 shift and a 3, 4 shift solenoid. Now, those are kind of obvious. They're obviously going to be for those particular shifts. However, the lockup solenoid is referred to as a PWM solenoid. Uh, most of the times when we hear that a PWM solenoid, we automatically think of line pressure. But that solenoid is actually for lockup. It is a PWM solenoid, so it's going to control the apply and the amount of slip rate on the converter. Now, the last solenoid is the pressure control solenoid. 
That one was referred to as the modulating pressure regulator solenoid. The shift pressure control solenoids are somewhat unique, and we're going to cover that function a little bit later. Now, the modulating pressure solenoid controls line pressure just like any other computer-controlled transmission. It's going to raise pressure on the spring side of the pressure regulator valve, so obviously it takes more line pressure to stroke the valve, and then we build line rise that way. The PWM solenoid, pretty standard, straightforward lockup solenoid. It, it's going to control the converter clutch operation. Now, where the Mercedes is uh, radically different is obviously in the way the shift solenoids work. Now, because each shift solenoid releases one clutch while applying uh, the timing of the next clutch coming on, this is to prevent flares or bind ups during the shift transition. Uh, each shift solenoid has its own bank of four valves. So each shift solenoid is going to have a common, uh, a command valve, a holding pressure valve, a shift pressure, and a pressure overlap valve. And we're going to show you that here in just a moment. So we have a total of 12 valves controlling all the shifts on this transmission. Uh, the basic operations of the four valves works the same way for each shift. So to initiate a shift, the computer is going to turn on uh, for example, the one-two shift solenoid. Now, as the computer turns on the one-two shift four-five solenoid, it strokes the command valve and starts to initiate the actual shift transaction. The other three uh, control valves are going to control uh, the rate of the V1 brake, which is being applied, and the K1 clutch, uh, the V1 brake being released, and the K1 clutch being applied. Once the shift is complete, the computer will turn off the 1, 2, 4, 5 shift solenoid. That's normal. And that's where it gets a little bit confusing. If you're monitoring the solenoid operation, the first time you've seen this, it, it's kind of odd because you'll see the solenoid come on, the shift happens, then all of a sudden all of the solenoid goes off. So we have no solenoids on once the shift is complete. The same thing is going to happen when we go from a 2-1 shift. On the downshift, you're going to see the computer turn the same solenoid on again the 1, 2, 4, 5 shift solenoid. Once the transition is complete, the computer will then turn the solenoid back off once we're back in first gear. Now the shift from second to third, same thing. You're going to see the 2, 3 shift solenoid come on. Once the shift is complete, the solenoid goes off again. Then all three shift solenoids are off while we're in third. Again, 3, 2 downshift, same thing. You'll see the solenoid come back on. We get back into second gear all the solenoids are turned off again. Now, during each one of the shifts, the shift pressure control solenoid um, is going to control the amount, the amount of rate of the release clutch, and the modulator pressure solenoid is also going to be controlling line pressure at the same time. So these two solenoids work together during the overlap of each shift. So it's kind of important that we make sure that these solenoids are, are clean, there's no debris in them, they're not hanging up. Uh, because that can cause a lot of shift concerns. On the next page of your handout, you'll see the identification of all the solenoids. As you can see here, these two solenoids, this is your line pressure and shift field solenoid, the shift pressure regulator. Now, we can obviously swap these two solenoids back and forth if we needed to, uh, just to test to see if that's causing our problem. Now, the other three solenoids that you're going to see, these three right here, they all have the same flat tops to them. Now we can swap any one of these three around also to check for um, or to diagnose any kind of a shift complaint. Now this one over here, this solenoid is for lockup. That's the only one that's like that, so you can't switch that one with any of the others. There's your solenoid apply chart, and like I said before, we're in first gear. None of the solenoids are on, so all three shift solenoids are actually off. Now we'll see that the Modulating pressure solenoid is modulating, and the shift pressure control solenoid is on. Now, as we make the 1-2 shift, we're going to modulate the 1-2-4-5 shift solenoid. And then we're going to modulate the shift pressure control. Once the shift is complete, no solenoids are on, no shift solenoids, that is. The uh, modulating pressure solenoid is still going to be modulating, and then you'll actually see the shift pressure go back to on. Uh, again, coming back down from second to first, you see the same reaction from the same solenoids as we did during the upshifts. And you can see that through the chart that all the solenoids basically uh, work the same way. 
These are the uh, four banks that I was talking about. This is the four valve bank that we have for the one, two, four, five solenoid. On the right here, this is three of the four for the two, three shift solenoid. There's the legend on the next uh, page. This is the last of the four for the two, three bank. And there's the four for the three, four shift solenoid. You notice the only thing that changes on the name is what the solenoid is, the, the actual solenoid that's controlling that valve. Um, so they're all named the same. They all work the same way for each solenoid. Check ball locations are located on the next page. Uh, you have four plastic check balls. These are shuttle balls. The eight steel balls that you'll find in the check in the, in the valve body, those are for um, clutch exhaust. They're actually used to regulate clutch exhaust. One of the things I want to mention here is um, on this transmission, do not use a grease that's too thick. Uh, if it takes uh, a thicker grease or even white lithium lube, it takes more heat to actually melt that grease. So if the check ball uh, doesn't stay free in the, inside the, especially the ones inside the bathtubs, we could have an issue with shift feel. Uh, so it's always good to use something like Vaseline or Transgel that's designed to melt quickly with heat. This is the uh, filters and the pressure feed check valve locations. Notice that there's a little spring type lever on the bottom of the screen. Uh, we want to make sure that that's not broken. Uh, obviously if the screen falls below the um, casting here, it's not going to be up against the plate and it's really not going to be doing its job. The same thing especially with this pressure feed check valve that you see in the bottom right. The small side of the check valve has to have pressure against the plate. Again, when we put the bottom, the, the thicker piece down in first, we want to make sure that this top part just a little bit above the casting. This is a question that I run into all the time with guys, and I just want to kind of make this a, a little clearer for everyone. How do the speed sensors work? We have two speed sensors, as you can see here, right on the conductor plate. The first thing I want to mention is these are input speed sensors. There's not, this is not an input and output. Now the N3 is the one towards the front of the trans, the N2 is towards the middle of the trans. Uh, they're both Hall effect sensors. Both of them have the same resistance of 4.5 ohms. Now the weird part is a lot of guys will be diagnosing this and on data stream um, you'll see that the uh, speed sensors aren't doing anything in first gear. Uh, hold on just a second, we have a question. Is there a way to print out this information? Uh, there should be a uh, PDF that you can download of all this information. So this actual webinar is in the PDF that you should have been able to download right onto your computer. Hope that answers your question. Okay, so anyways, uh, guys have changed the conductor plate because obviously these speed sensors are part of the conductor plate. They may have a code for the N3 or N2 speed sensor. And when they change the plate and they monitor it, they'll call me on the tech line and say, hey, the speed sensor is not working in first, and then it's working in second, third, and fourth, and drops out again in fifth. Well, that's normal. Uh, both the N2 and the N3 are going to read the same in both second, third, and fourth. This is the way the computer can tell if there's any slip issues. Uh, the N3 is not going to read in first or fifth gear. It will read reverse in the sport mode. Because as you can see here in the chart, the K1 clutch is not on in first, fifth, or normal reverse. And that's what the, N3, uh, the N3 is, is reading. Same as the N2, it's reading the K1 clutch apply. So neither one of them are going to read in reverse. And uh, well, the N2 won't read in reverse, but the N3 will if you're in the sport mode. Now both sensors being Hall effect, they're going to create a 4 to 8 volt pulse square wave. Okay, yes, the PDF um, was, should have been emailed to you in the invitation. So you may want to check your email to see if your uh, PDF file is there. Okay. Now, the N3 is reading the K1 clutch drum, which has the F1 Sprag and the V1 clutch hub all assembled into one. Now, that's being held in first gear because the Sprag is holding in first gear, as you can see here. So the sensor is looking at this exciter wheel. One of the things I'd like to mention is 
you can see how it's uh, like pressed into this um, this drum so you want to make sure that's not loose that can give you a false speed sensor signal so you could be changing the speed sensor only to find that you have a problem here with the excited wheel being loose on the drum now the N2 actually reads the front carry assembly so you can see this is not an output speed they're both input speeds uh, again too we want to make sure that this excited wheel is not loose uh, so you want to check this on the carrier and make sure that it's good and tight. Torque converter operation is uh, nothing really unique here. Uh, it's usually activated in third, fourth, or fifth. There's always going to be a slip to this converter. It's never going to go to a zero RPM slip. That's normal. Now the amount of slip depends obviously on road conditions, uh, where you have the shifter uh, you know, shift it to whatever gear you're in. Temperature is going to be a factor also. One of the things I do want to mention is don't be concerned if you see that the actual housing of the converter has a blue or a bluish tint to it. That's normal because the way the factory furnace braces the fins on these converters, it actually makes the, the, uh, the color of the, the uh, steel look like, um, like it's blue. I know we're used to seeing something that if it's metal and it turns blue that it's been overheated, but that's actually the normal look of the converter, uh, so don't be fooled by that. Uh, obviously, if we have a transmission with extremely burnt fluid, we're going to want to change the converter anyways in case the clutches inside are burnt. One thing that's important is we're going to look at another ID tag, and as you can see here, this is a good time to get your camera back out and take a picture of this ID label because it has to match the transmission which matches the vehicle because of differential uh, ratios, tire size and engine size. So we want to make sure that the um, that we, we get this information recorded and keep it in a database. Some of the converters on these vehicles have a spring damper inside and some don't. So mismatching converters can actually make a, a lot of shift complaints, especially locker complaints or shutters. Um, so we want to make sure we're using the right stuff. Uh, there's a way you can actually air check the torque converter if you feel that the clutch is not uh, holding. Basically take the K2 drum as you can see here, install it down inside the converter and we can apply some sharp air to that and see if the converter clutch is holding. You want to be careful here, obviously if there's some oil in the converter, we don't want to spread all over ourselves and everybody around us. Uh, there's the case. Uh, location for applying air to check the clutch packs here. Uh, one of the things I probably mention at every one of my seminars or webinars, you'll probably always hear me say that you should put some type of a regulator on your blow gun and actually do your air checks with 30 PSI. When you're taking apart the V2, V3 clutch housing, uh, the B3 piston, one of the things that I would do here is I'd make an ID mark, whether it's a scratch or a couple of dots like this. We want to align this correctly when it goes back together because, as you can see, this is splined into the case. So if this is off a little bit from the actual housing, when we slide this back down inside, we're not going to be able to uh, align the bolt holes up correctly for the bolts to hold this in place. So it's a good idea to, before we take the piston off, to go ahead and and make an ID mark there. Let's talk a little bit about shift complaints. Uh, shifts to fourth gear, drops back to third, kind of a bindy feeling on the three, four shift. Uh, obviously it will go to fail safe eventually. One of the common areas that we find problems with is right here in the, uh, the springs on the uh, three, one, two, four, five command valve. Uh, what's really nice about having this uh, bank of four valves for each shift we know that if we're having a problem on the 1, 2, or the 4, 5 shift, I'm going to go right to these four valves. These are the only four valves I'm going to check. So I can take the, I would definitely take these valves out, make sure the bores are okay, there's no scratches and things like that on the valve. We find a lot of these springs being collapsed or actually broken. So if I'm in here with a scribe or a small screwdriver and I feel there's no tension on the valve, obviously i got a problem with the spring but these should be checked anyways. Let's talk a little bit about our two sprags. A lot of times we've been misdiagnosing shift complaints, 
not thinking that a sprag could actually cause it. One common uh, problem that we found when the 545 RFE first came out, the low reverse clutch and the underdrive clutch are on for first gear. When they dump the low reverse clutch at about five or six miles an hour, the sprag has to hold before the 2C clutch applies. So obviously if the sprag is bad, we would get a 1-2 flare. And I've had several guys when that unit first came out uh, chasing their tail looking for a hydraulic slip or a valve body or solenoid problem only to find out that it was the sprag actually causing the flare. The same thing can happen with this transmission. A lot of the complaints that I get is a slip bang or chatter on takeoff. The, the most common of all the complaints is a 2-1 downshift clump. And once in a while, I'll also get a 1-2 flare. So you can see that the sprag here has to hold during the transition of the 1-2 shift. The B1 clutch is releasing as the weight K1 clutch is being applied during that shift. So obviously, if that sprag's not holding, there's my 1-2 flare. Uh, one of the other points I want to mention is before 2004, if you're working on one of these units, the SPRAG has been updated from 20 uh, from 16 elements to 20 elements. You should have the part, uh, inf part number in the uh, handout material also. Another thing we want to do is take a real good look at the status support right here because that's the inner race for that SPRAG. So if you see any damage or gouging in here, we're going to have to replace that also. Now the uh, F2 sprag can actually cause a 2-3 for a complaint. Same thing, that sprag is holding in first and second. When it goes to make the 2-3 shift, the K3 clutch is being released, the K2 clutch is coming on. Obviously, if the sprag is not holding, there's where I'd get a complaint of a 2-3 flare. That is the most common complaint for that sprag failing. One of the things when you take the sprag apart, if you're cleaning it up, these actual elements may fall out of the sprag assembly. It's not a big deal, just got to remember that there's a small foot on one side and a larger foot on the other. So you want to make sure that the larger footer foot faces towards the outer edge of the sprag. Uh, this is one of those after rebuilds uh, you got bit because you didn't catch this problem when the, uh, when the kit came in to you. There's two different clutches for the K2 um, clutch. And obviously you can see once the clutches are assembled inside the drum and we set the drum down inside the trans, uh, we're not going to see the, the problem very easily. Uh, what the complaint will be is your first row test after rebuild, you kind of felt a 2-3 drag or bind. Then all of a sudden there's no 2-3 shift at all. Then we're going to be into fail safe. What you're going to do is you're going to drop the pan. You're going to find a lot of fine aluminum material in the pan. And that's because... The difference between the two clutches is on these smaller engines like the six cylinders versus the eight. The outside diameter of these two clutches are the same. It's the inside that's different. And here's the uh, two clutches, one laying on top of the other. You can see the outside diameter is the same. And there's a tremendous difference on the inside diameter where the, the actual teeth of the clutch are going to set down on top of the planetary. So that's correct. There's going to be two different planetaries for this unit, smaller engines versus the V8. So if you take the clutch and you set it down, the large clutch down onto this planetary, that's where your problem is. And you're not going to feel that during assembly. It's going to go together pretty easily. Obviously, we can't make the mistake in the other direction because we're not going to fit the smaller clutch on the larger planet. So you'll pick that problem up real quick. Here's what happens when we take the V8 and we put it on the smaller planet. You can see the teeth here are barely catching the splines on the, the, uh, the hub side of the planetary. And like I said, you probably get one, maybe two shifts out of it uh, before the failure happens, and you'll see all that metallic dust uh, in the bottom of the pan. This is how it should, should fit if it's uh, if the correct clutch for the correct planet. I advise taking the clutches from the kit and checking them on the splines on every rebuild to make sure that your uh, your kit wasn't misassembled with the wrong clutches. You have all the clutch diameter, tooth counts, thicknesses, and part numbers there for you, including the quantity of clutches per you know per drum. So you have all that information in your handout. No upshifts. Uh, this is real common on Mercedes, especially. Uh, same thing will happen on a Chrysler product. If the ABS light is on any Mercedes vehicle, that transmission is not going to upshift. 
It's not going to upshift and there will be no transmission codes. So if you have ABS issues or wheel speed sensor codes, you're going to have to correct those first. Now on some Mercedes you'll find a, a single output speed sensor mounted on the rear axle, but there are mo uh, other models that will have one front wheel speed sensor that's going to control uh, or tell the computer vehicle speed so that the computer will command the, the upshifts. So be aware that any ABS lights will cause that problem. Here's a complaint of a harsh 3-2 downshift. And that's because of the pressure feed valve. Uh, the spring was weak or broken, and the valve wasn't actually touching the plate. So like I said before, the top of this uh, check valve has to have some pressure up against the plate. Early shifts, late shift, harsh shift complaints, even soft shifts. Uh, all these complaints, not on just this vehicle, but just about everything that we work on out there uh, today, Fords, GMs, it doesn't matter. Mass airflow is probably the number one sensor, um, not only for shift timing, but it's the sensor for load, uh, for engine load, and that's also going to control pressure rise. So any kind of uh, shift complaints and things like that, especially if you have a mass airflow sensor code, we're going to have to go there first. Now, one of the things we want to do is take a look at the wiring, make sure there's no uh, no areas where it rubbed through, where the wiring may be shorted, because you can actually have a mass airflow sensor that's not setting a code uh, working improperly, that it's not controlling the line pressure correctly, and have shift flares or harsh shifts. Um, one of the things that I like to do when these vehicles come in is I'll take the air filter out and look at it. If it looks like it's the type of a customer that doesn't maintain their vehicle, if that air filter looks pretty dirty, I can pretty much guarantee you that the mass airflow is dirty. Uh, it's always a good test to go ahead and clean it, but don't use brake clean or, or um, carburetor cleaner. There are uh, spray cleaners that are made just for mass airflow sensors. Uh, using those sprays will prevent any issues with causing O2 sensor damage, so you should use the correct spray to actually clean those. Now you may actually go in there and clean it one or two times before you actually see a difference in the way it shifts. But uh, it's something that should be done on uh, any vehicle that's giving you that type of a problem. No move condition, no upshifts. This is a good time to take your scan tool out, even if you don't have these codes. Um, the the uh, U0404 is probably the most common code I see on Jeeps. It's for the shift module that's part of the shifter. So the module is actually down inside the shifter here. Um, if you have any issues with that, it can actually have a no move condition. Uh, I've seen times where there's no codes for it. But if you do have that code, and I can almost guarantee you if you call your Jeep uh, dealer, they'll have that in stock. They'll have the whole shifter assembly. I've had guys tell me, I, I know at one point we could buy just the module and change it. But from what I'm being told now, they're, they're actually selling the whole shifter assembly. They're not selling the module uh, separate. But that depends, on, I guess, on the dealer you're dealing with. Uh, I don't know what it's like across the whole country. I do know that in some areas, that's what I'm being told. Now, this is also a great area for coffee and soda to be spilled in here. Um, a lot of guys that change just the module would find later that the, the rivets or the brackets that hold the shifter assembly over time were just coming loose. And that was actually what was causing the problem. So I ended up having to change the whole shifter assembly anyways. So be aware of that, especially, um, especially look for any kind of stains from coffee or soda. This is a pretty common complaint on these vehicles, a ringing sound coming from the drive shaft. Uh, you can kind of hear the noise when you put the uh, transmission from drive to reverse or from reverse to drive. This is mostly found on Chrysler vehicles. As you can see here, we have four different part numbers for the output plans, obviously for four different engine sizes. So you have that information there. And then we also give you the tool numbers for the OE tool, but obviously you don't have to use the um, OE part number. You can use whatever tool you need to do this job here of taking the flange off. So we have the information there in the book for you. This is something we're seeing quite often. So if you have that complaint, this is the first thing that we're going to have to do to, to change this and update it. 
PO730, it's my most dreaded code. I hate this code on the tech line. Basically what the computer is saying is something is slipping. It doesn't tell us what gear is slipping. We may actually drive the vehicle and by the seat of our pants, I think the, uh, the transmission seems to be shifting fine. It doesn't have a slip, but we end up with a PO730. Now, for on Chrysler vehicles, uh, there is an actual TCM recalibration. It kind of widens that window or narrows that window, I should say, so that the amount of slip that the computer is picking up doesn't set the code. One of the other things I'd like to mention is this is the OE scan tool, the DRB3. It's actually available now to the aftermarket. I don't know what they're selling it for. Uh, again, that may depend on where you're buying it. But just to let you know that you can actually get the factory hand tool now for the uh, for the uh, Chrysler products. Same thing here as you see on the right. This is the Y-Tech. This is the software uh, that does everything that the handheld tool does, but this can be loaded onto a laptop. So you can have one laptop, put all kinds of different uh, scan tool software on it. So now you've got one tool that can do uh, several different types of vehicles. In today's market, most of the OE have gone to... Um, laptop software. They're not using handheld uh, scan tools at the dealer level anymore. Uh, so that's where the future is going, so it's something to think about. Stuck in fail-safe, unable to clear codes, or you may even have a transmission that's in a fail-safe, but there are no codes for the transmission. Uh, you'll go and check the TCM to find out that it's sending no voltage to the solenoids. Um, Modules have been changed, TCM modules have been changed, nothing seems to, uh, to, to fix it. If you look in the other modules, you'll find you may have some transfer case uh, codes there. If there's anything going on with communication between the transfer case module and the TCM, or if you have a transfer case uh, uh, shift motor that's not working correctly and that's setting codes, anything going on with that transfer case will put, will put the transmission in fail-safe and it won't, the transmission won't shift. You'll be stuck in fail-safe only because you have a problem either with the transfer case control module or any issues with communication back and forth or any problems with the transfer case uh, shift motor. So keep in mind that if you're working on some four-wheel drives, one of the things that I like to suggest is we always put the year, make, and model of the vehicle in our scan tools. Um, if you don't see all the codes or C codes in other modules that way, back out and go back in with the scan tool, except this time go use the generic mode. Because in the generic mode, if there's any code stored in other modules, they will definitely come up in the generic mode more often than you would see if you put it in under that particular vehicle model. Ratio codes and fail-safe. I've had several Chryslers and Jeeps where two-wheel drives uh, there was an issue with the differential. Somebody swapped the differential out and put the wrong differential in. So you can actually end up with ratio codes like PO731, 732, and it's because somebody actually changed the differential on the vehicle. I've seen it on Chrysler cars, and I've also seen it on Jeep vehicles. Um, not too long ago, I did a tech call on one. Uh, the transmission came in. It was in a Jeep. They had a problem with the sun gear. The front sun gear was bad, so they had to change all that. I went back and talked to them and, and found that we had the right ratio in it, but it kept kept setting codes. So as a, as a test, I said, go to the battery, disconnect the battery cables, clean them up. Even if your battery looks as good as the one in this picture, that's just a joke, guys. If your battery looks that bad, obviously when you're going to need to go there first. But even if the battery terminals look new, clean them. Follow the ground down to where it goes, clean that ground up. Now, these guys dealt with this Jeep for like a week and a half. Just by doing that on this Jeep, we've actually fixed ratio codes on it. Now, in my shop, that tool that you see right there to clean the terminals, every one of my installers had that. Every vehicle that left my shop always had the battery cables cleaned and the ground strap cleaned also. So they would follow that ground cable down to where it went, unbolted it, cleaned it up, and put it back. That's real important on, on just about any vehicle with electronics in today's market. Well, that ends our presentation for today. I'd like to thank you all for attending. And I also want to thank Seal After, Aftermarket Products for sponsoring our seminar and making it available to anyone. Now, if you have any questions before I close out the webinar, I would like you to 
look on your, your list where your name is and you'll see a little hand sign. If you have a question and you're going to take time to type it in, go ahead and put up your hand so I can see that there is a question coming in. This way here I won't, uh, I won't click out of the seminar too soon. Okay, it looks like we're not going to have too many questions coming in. Just a reminder, in uh, two weeks from today at the same time, the next webinar will be on the LCT-1000. So I hope to see you guys attend that one. Okay, that looks like that's about it for questions. I want to thank you guys again, and I hope I see you in two weeks for the LCT 1000 webinar.